Second session. All right, I think we uh, for our next witness. Yes, Your Honor. Right. You may call your next will. Let's get the jury in here first. I guess that might be important. We need our 12 first and then the alternate. So. coming in. It's my understanding that there's, there's no objections that are being raised to the documentary evidence that was being discussed that we thought we might have to have a jury out here on. Was the recording right. in progress? Council approach the bench, please. I just would remind you that if you need to make sure that you let me know when you have a Then we have, well, we're waiting on our four alternates as soon as we get them on the ready. <clears throat> All right, we have everyone here, so Mr. Evans, you may call your next witness. Your Honor, the defense would call Dr. Melissa Karen. Karen, if you'll come forward, please. I'll ask you to raise your right hand and face our clerk and let the clerk place you under oath. Please solemnly swear that the evidence you're about to give in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Okay. Thank you. If you'll have a seat there and. That microphone is to project your voice throughout the room, so if you'll speak directly into that, that will be a great benefit. Good afternoon, Dr. Karen. Good morning, thank you. Could you please state your full name and spell your last for the benefit of the jury? Melissa Ann, last name Karen, C-A-R-R-A-N. And Dr. Kieran, what do you do for a living? Uh, I'm a neurologist uh, specializing in epilepsy. And how long have you been a neurologist? Uh, uh, 22 years. And where do you practice out of? Uh, 
Cooper University Hospital, uh, Camden Medical School, and Camden, New Jersey. Okay. And <clears throat> you provided me your curriculum vita before we uh, started in on this case. I'm going to hand that to you. And if you could describe for the jury a little bit about your educational background. Certainly. Um, I uh, went to college in Kentucky at Center College and then to um, uh, medical education at University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, graduating in 1994. I then moved to Philadelphia where I uh, took part in a uh, neurology residency and stayed on for two years to study epilepsy and electrophysiology. Uh, during that last two years, I uh, worked uh, as well at uh, Cooper Hospital where I then took a job uh, when I finished my epilepsy training. And what has been your primary area of practice since graduating from medical school? Neurology. Okay. And do you have any particular specialization? Epilepsy and electrophysiology, the EEGs and the, the studies related to epilepsy and epilepsy patients. I also see uh, general neurology, mostly central nervous system related neurology, meaning brain dysfunction and spinal cord. About how many individuals do you think in your career have you uh, conducted neurological examinations on? Thousands. Um, I've been working full time since graduation from medical school in '94. Um, I've I, I couldn't even estimate. You know. And as part of your education and your expertise, um, do you commonly review MRIs? I've seen many thousands of MRIs, uh, brain MRIs also, other MRIs, but mostly brain scans um, as they relate to strokes and epilepsy and head trauma. Your Honor, at this time I would proffer Dr. Kieran as an expert in the area of neuro neurology. Any objection? And I would ask. Right, she'll be qualified as such an expert. And I would ask that her uh, CV be made the next exhibit. That would be, what's the next number, 261? Two, exhibit 261 will be her curriculum by. Have you, um, during your career, uh, published in any um, journals? Yes, I have uh, 13 or so um, peer-reviewed journal publications, um, about more than half of these, I was the first author or the, um, the group uh, chief. And so in your practice as it stands today, what's a, what's a typical day for you? Well, I see patients every day, uh, usually with a medical student or a resident. And I, um, you know, I work a, a full day, um, at five days a week. Uh, I used to do weekend coverage, but now the systems uh, have a, we have a system where hospitalists, neurohospitalists do that. Um, so I, I see patients every day. Okay. And at some point, um, you were contacted uh, and asked to, to do something in this case on behalf of Mr. Wiggins. What was that? To offer an opinion and examine the case as it relates to his epilepsy. Okay. And as part of that, did you conduct any any evaluations or examinations on Mr. Wiggins? Yes, I, um, I took a, a standard uh, history and physical examination and uh, did, a, did an, uh, a comprehensive neurologic examination. All right. Did you um, review historical data as well, medical records and different things? Yes, I reviewed uh, hospital records and seizure uh, incident uh, records. Okay. And did you form any conclusions? Yes, I did. And kind of in summary, what were, what, what were your conclusions as it related to Mr. Wiggins? That he had suffered um, a right frontal lobe deficit, which was apparent purely based on his neurologic, neurologic examination, and that uh, at some time in probably early childhood, this had caused uh, the onset of seizures. And did you draft a report as part of your uh, findings in this case? Yes. I'm going to pass you a copy of that report. Let me know if you can identify it. Yes, this is my report. Okay.
So <clears throat> let's walk back through and kind of unpack in, in, in more specific fashion what steps you took in evaluating Mr. Wiggins. So what did you, what do you do first? Go oh, actually do a physical examination on Mr. Wiggins. I review records that are available before I talk to someone typically. Okay. And did the records that you reviewed indicate that uh, Stephen Wiggins had a history of seizures? Yes, absolutely. There's, I think, no question about that. Right. And do you recall at approximately what time the first record is of him experiencing the seizures were? I believe the f that uh, the records indicated that he was about age 12 or 13 uh, when he had his first witness seizure, diagnosed seizure. Uh, certainly, probably he had seizures before that. Um, okay. And you said something about a right frontal lobe deficit. So what, what does that mean? Uh, well, that based on my neurologic exam, I could tell that he had a right frontal lobe deficit because he had spasticity and um, increased deep tenor reflexes and um, uh, smaller size of areas on the left face, arm, and leg. Um, well, what do you do? You're talking about the physical examination. So what, what is a... Uh, a a, a physical examination for a neurologist. What, what, what do you, let's walk, walk the jury through that. What do you do to determine those things? So I, I ask him, you know, his history. I ask him to tell me about himself at first, and that, that gives us information about cognitive function. And then I ask him specific questions about orientation and um, uh, just on function uh, as it relates to some emotional processing. Uh, then I ask him, um, um, to, you know, I test his memory, I test his ability to do simple math, I test his ability to, um, to initiate um, attention-related um, uh, tasks, such as I, you gave him a string of letter, letters, such as B, A, C, T, A, A, and I ask him to tap for A every time that he hears an A, uh, which, interestingly, he was not able to do. He had sort of an inability to inhibit uh, a tapping just for the A. He, he would tap for many other letters, uh, even though he knew immediately afterward that it wasn't what he should have done, I think. Uh, he was not able to stop tapping, which is unusual. I don't even, I don't see that in uh, normal people, and I usually don't see it in demented people even, but I do see it in some brain damaged people. And did you review brain scans as they related to Mr. Wiggins? Yes, I reviewed his MRI brain uh, and his PET scan, uh, the, the metabolic scan, I think, which has been already re reviewed uh, by Dr. Bigler. And did you note anything of significance when you looked at the uh, MRI of Mr. Wiggins' brain? Yes, the MRI, of course, showed um, the area of, of brain damage in the, or the right orbital frontal region and um, a very nice, discreet, I think you referred to it as a hole, if I'm, uh, which is a little unusual to see something that um, long-standing where it's simply just uh, complete tissue loss. And what do you mean by that when you say it's, it's unusual to see something uh, that long-standing without tissue loss? If there's a recent uh, head trauma or a stroke, uh, we typically see what's called encephalomalacia, which is basically damage and scarring of the tissue around the injury, and it appears white on the MRI in certain, um, in, in certain um, images. And uh, that's more typical for uh, a recent or um, semi-recent uh, brain injury. And the, as a neurologist, in, in with your experience and expertise, does that tell you anything about when that uh, hole that I've referred to, when, when that may have occurred? Uh, well, we, we won't know for sure, but it, it could not have really occurred given his neurologic examination and given the appearance of the damage. It could not have been recent. 
Uh, and it must have been uh, fairly remote uh, since he's only in his 30s. It must have been in early childhood or more likely in the perinatal uh, time uh, in utero, meaning when his mother was pregnant, which is not uncommon that there's brain damage that occurs during the birth or during um, you know, just the stress to the womb or uh, during delivery or during, very, during infancy or very early childhood. And someone with that type of brain deficit, in your experience, what would you expect to see on how it impacts their ability, ability to function? So, he, so Mr. Wiggins uh, looks very normal. Uh, most people with the right frontal lobe deficit uh, we'll have a little bit more in terms of, um, you know, spasticity and, and difficulty walking. Um, but the, it, since it, it caused damage to this orbital frontal region, they would have trouble regulating their behavior. And so that area is sort of like an on-off switch. And so, you know, most of us can know better than to, for instance, go and punch somebody that took our parking place. We can inhibit that reaction. But he um, may have difficulty not acting on his uh, impulses. Is that part of the brain kind of like the brakes? Yes, it's, it's, the, um, it's the area that we use to initiate behavior and to turn behavior off. And people with damage to that area, most of them with you know, d developmental and uh, intellectual disability uh, would have a lot of trouble um, managing their behavior. Okay. And you talked about the physical neurological exam. And did you find any asymmetries in his physicality during your exam? Yes, he, he uh, his left arm was shorter uh, that day and he uh, had some facial asymmetry. His left face had not developed um, as much as his right face, and uh, he um, had increased reflexes on the left. And what, what does that tell you? Uh, that, that tells me that the brain um, some t it's at some point had been injured, um, more likely early in life since the deficits were so um, set. It takes a while for the deficits to become imprinted. And since he was, they, the side was smaller, it had to have happened quite early. And when you were, <clears throat> you said you looked at some social history for Mr. Wiggins as well? Yes, I did. In, in, in your area of neurology, uh, what did that history show you that you thought was relevant to your opinion that you're giving here today? No, not much, except that it was clear that he had a lack of um, sort of a stable uh, childhood uh, situation um, and that things had been rather chaotic and that there had probably been uh, a deficiency of supportive services for him to, to compensate for his behavioral problems. And you said you looked at, a, 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 from his history, some notes of seizures over time? Yes. And was there anything well, before we get into that, let me ask you this. What, what is a seizure? A seizure is, um, often we refer to it as an electric storm. In order to move my arm, for instance, I have to uh, produce an electric uh, current on my left brain. And um, when that gets disrupted from a scar, it fires off abnormally and may produce a storm that can uh, then spread in any number of ways to either being a grand mal seizure, which we're most, most uh, familiar with, which is the most common type of seizure that has been reported uh, for, for Mr. Wiggins, or a focal seizure, which, for instance, if someone's having a right frontal lobe seizure, it may just consist of staring and automatic behavior. So in other words, um, if I'm cooking and I have a right frontal lobe seizure, I may not be able to, um, I may have repetitive activity. I may continue stirring uh, in a sort of a purposeful way, actually stirring and maybe even putting something in the pan. But I may burn myself because I'm not conscious of what I'm doing. If, um, if it spreads a little bit more, I might ha have left face twitching or right arm twitching, which may then spread throughout the whole brain and become what is 
typically which is what, what is often reported in him because they don't see the other uh, episodes as the generalized tonic clonic convulsions where the eyes roll back and there may be incontinence and the like. And you said the term tonic clonic, what is that? That's the uh, sort of known as a grand mal seizure so often, you know, the brain, the neurons are discharging and the muscles become completely engaged um, in an involuntary way and there's generalized jerking because the motor areas of the brain are engaged and so there's generalized jerking like a, uh, as in a grand mal seizure, and tonic, and then cl as it reduces, clonic. And then based on your review of Mr. Wiggins' history, did he have a history of those tonic-clonic seizures? Uh, some were, refer were referred to as tonic-clonic seizures, yes. And Mostly they just re referred to convulsing and that kind of thing. And is, was there anything particularly of note to you about the descriptions that were made by others as to what he would do physically during a seizure? Yes, the records uh, also noted some of the focal seizure, although I think there weren't, there was a, sort of a, there weren't that many reported for obvious reasons. People don't notice them. Uh, but some of the seizures he would just lightly convulse and his left arm would, would jerk. And what does that tell you as a, in your field if someone's left <laughs> arm jerks versus the right arm? That the seizure focus is remaining in the left frontal area, uh, not spreading to the rest of the brain. So if someone is seizing and they're using their, and I'm always, I get this confused about what part of the brain works, what part of the body. So if someone raises their left arm in a seizure, that indicates what side of the brain was, is being affected. So it's everything's crossed. My right brain controls my left body, and my left brain controls my right body. And from your review of Mr. Wiggins' history and your exam of him, are you able to determine where, what part of the brain his, his seizures originate from? Yes, that was quite clear before we saw the MRI even, that they were coming from the right frontal lobe which is not a common place. It's sort of a hard to treat area for seat to have a seizure originate. And it's always associated with behavioral and intellectual problems. So you said that's not a common place to see a seizure originate? No, it's not, certainly not one of the more common places. I mean, there, it's, it's a difficult kind of epilepsy and oftentimes the EEGs, are, the brainwave studies are normal, the electroencephalop, encephalograms are normal and people may even be diagnosed as having behavioral problems not epilepsy is is the fact that the seizures are originating in the same well let me ask you this is there any significance that the fact that the seizures are originating in the right frontal lobe and the fact that there's that's where the hole is in his brain well, it, you know, it makes it worse. So the more I have, the more the patient has convuls convulsions and seizures from the area of damage, the more damage ensues. And you know, he does have um, findings of, of pretty serious damage just on cursory testing and, uh, and neuropsychological testing. He neglects the left side of his world at times. And that's, you know, that's something that if he wasn't having seizures, he could have recovered from. That function might have gone somewhere else in his brain. He could have, he could have rewired a little bit, but um, he hasn't been able to do that. So at times, if, you know, when, I, if, when you ask him to draw a clock, he's, he sort of bunches everything into the right side of the clock, and he neglects the left side of the clock. So he's at times neglecting the left side of his world which is very common, in, for instance, in people who have strokes of the right brain and in more or less the same distribution. They may neglect, you may show them their own hand and say, whose hand is this? And they may say yours, they don't know. They, they can't, they can't um, figure out, they can't assign uh, what, what things in their left visual field are. They can't name them, they can't figure out what they are. So you said something about drawing a clock. What 
Is, is that a, a, a particular kind of testing that you, that you conduct? Well, it's just part of a simple, I, I mean, I'm not a neuropsychologist. They do much more extensive testing, but um, it's, it's, very, it's just a classic test of are there spatial, are there difficulties in the spatial organization of the brain that make people attend to one side of the world more than the other side? Does, based on your review of all the information related to Mr. Wiggins, does, does he have a normal brain? No, he does not. And based on what you can tell about what I've been calling the hole in the brain, the brain abnormality. The brain related, damage. Yes, the deficit related to Mr. Wiggins. Um, is it your opinion that this could in any way, that that abnormality could in any way be related to drug abuse? No, that wouldn't. Drug abuse can certainly cause uh, strokes and uh, lesions. It could have caused his white matter lesions. Uh, but the, the, the damage that he has is not from uh, one of the, any, any drug abuse. Those typically cause spasms in blood vessels. And the area that's damaged in him is not a discrete area that's supplied by a blood vessel. It's not, it's not from drug use. Okay. And obviously, other people have seizures. Uh, that, that why, is, why are Stephen's seizures different from someone else who may suffer from epilepsy? Well, they're frontal lobe seizures, which are always really, really bad. I mean, they just cause so much difficulty for the patient and the family and the education and um, you know they're not they're very hard to treat his he's never been seizure free if he had been at a good medical center if he'd entered uh, ended up at Vanderbilt in their video monitoring uh, unit he would have had a, a frontal lobectomy to get rid of the seizures and it may have helped the behavior as well you know you've heard of the old uh, frontal lobotomies well that's what that's what they were doing not, you know, plus minus epilepsy. He would have had surgery. He would have had that frontal lobe taken out so to stop the seizures, but it didn't happen and none of the medications really stopped them. Now, are you aware of it, whether he's been on medication over the past few years, proper seizure med medication? Yes, I believe he's been given uh, Kephra in the jail. Okay. And uh, from your understanding, has that helped? From your review of the records, has that helped with his seizures? He's still having seizures. Uh, it would be hard for me to say without, I think the report is he's doing well. I think, uh, you know, I think the whole thing's a problem. The management's awful. He needed a, he needed a, a proper evaluation and treatment and he, he didn't happen for whatever reason. And, <clears throat> When you were doing your evaluation of Mr. Wiggins, did you ever get any indication that you thought he was trying to embellish his symptom, symptomatology to you? No, in fact, to his credit, he really didn't try to um, put on an act. He was quite neutral, and um, I didn't feel like he was manipulative at all. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really form an opinion about his, him as a person at all. I saw him once. He just seemed to do what we asked and, and followed the instructions and did his best. And did he appear to be trying to do the best he could possibly do when you were uh, doing your evaluation? I think so, yes. He, he did everything I asked him to and did his best, absolutely. There's, would, are there any other, did you note any other particular symptoms that you would opine would be a direct result of his brain damage that we haven't talked about yet? Well, you know, the seizures cause all kinds of problems. They may cause him to actually not be able to see at all from the left with the spread of the seizures. They may cause him to have panic. They may cause him to have, you know, severe frustration. Um, the, you know, the seizures can start very small and stay very local and cause increase in his already problematic behavior 
Uh, they can spread back to the visual areas. They can spread to the temporal lobe, which causes other kinds of behavioral problems and sort of, uh, you know, behavior that, that is um, uh, not, not good or, or uh, looks maladaptive. Dr. Karen, is there any question that Mr. Wiggins has brain damage? There's no question. Would the, the damage to Tina's brain affect, you talked about impulsivity, would it affect um, how he talked to people as far as what he thinks he might say? Yes, he's really not able to uh, inhibit his responses. So he may, for instance, if asked a question, he's not able to st step back and think about the answer. He's going to impulsively say the first thing that comes to his mind. Um, and I don't, he probably doesn't even realize, you know, he probably doesn't know why he does that. He's, I think he's pretty clueless about all this. Um, he maybe gets a few laughs when he when he says inappropriate things, but the problem is the brain damage. Um, same question, but uh, as it relates to his actions, someone with with Stephen's you know damaged brain. I mean, would that have the same effect on his actions? His acting without without thinking, without the ability to step back and consider. Yes, it would certainly translate into impulsive um, actions. And generally speaking, that part of the brain, frontal lobe, um, if, if you've got a damage to that part of your brain, does it affect other parts of your brain as well, and how, or how your brain functions overall? Yes, especially frontal lobe, because it's so connected. The networks um, for the frontal lobe, which is the seat of, our, of all of our higher intellectual and cognitive abilities, uh, that's where everything happens. Um, for instance, his, he, his attention is very poor. Um, and Well, I shouldn't say very poor, but he has attention problems. Um, he's going to have a lot of difficulty learning. I mean, he certainly had a learning disability that, that maybe wasn't exactly um, treated or um, maybe maybe they tried to help him. Um, but it's going to affect all of his cognitive functioning. And that that's very classic for frontal lobe lesions and epilepsy, especially with epilepsy. He's got this toxic combination of the brain damage and the seizures and the ongoing di damage from the seizures and um, and then the medications. One moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, I would um, ask that Dr. Karen's report be made the next numbered exhibit. All right, that would be exhibit uh, 262. If Your Honor will indulge me for one moment. Oh, sorry. Dr. Kieran, you, you testified mo a moment ago that the seizures continue to cause damage to Stephen's brain. Is that, is that, is that accurate? Well, we don't know the degree to which they're doing that, but he's certainly having major generalized convulsive seizures ongoing. And with those types of seizures, it, are those indicative when they occur? Do they cause more damage to someone's brain? Do they further um, hurt the brain, for lack of a better term? Well, they interrupt normal function and development. Um, so yes. I, I, it's a spectrum, and you know, I, we can't, we, we just wouldn't be able to exactly grade how much damage there is ongoing. But we would expect that he certainly can't, com he can't recover from this, the area of damage. Thank you. Those are my questions, Jeff. Mr. Sagi. Council of Brooks and Bench, please.
Good morning, Dr. Karen. Good morning. So I'm going to go over a couple different things so that I can fully understand your report that has just been made in exhibit. You said that you examined the defendant, Mr. Wiggins. When did you examine the defendant? In February of 2020. Uh, the date I don't have in front of me, but I can pull it up. The day. So that would be about a year and a half after the criminal incident. I'm not sure. February 10th. Do you know what date you examined him? Yes, February February 10th, 2020. And where did you examine him? Uh, in the prison. I'm not sure what the name of the prison was. Okay. And how long was your examination? Um, I believe it, I, I believe I was in the prison for over two hours, uh, around about two hours. Okay. And your examination, for your testimony, consisted of a physical examination, taking social history from Mr. Wiggins and the physical examination, that's correct? Well, I talked to him about his medical and uh, social and uh, family history and uh, I, I examined him, yes. Okay, and your comprehensive, uh, well, we'll start first with, when you said that you've received, you've reviewed medical and social history information, what specifically did you review? I reviewed um, the brain scans, the MRI and the PET. I reviewed the neuropsychological testing from Dr. Uh, Watson and Dr. Schacht. I reviewed uh, uh, medical records from uh, the various um, um, admissions to hospitals and emergency rooms. I, rever I reviewed um, the, the prison seizure records. And did you review all of those prior to your examination, no. Mr. Wiggins? No, I only reviewed a few of the hospital records prior, previous. And you stated in your report that Mr. Wiggins' first clinical seizure was at uh, age 14 in gym class. That's the first one that's actually documented. observed, correct? I believe that's the first one that was documented, but I, I don't have good documentation about that. And, and doctor, in the development of a, of a brain and something for neuro, neuro, neurology, is it important to know if um, an individual is using drugs or alcohol? Yes, there, that, there are uh, various reasons that's important, uh, some more than others. And would it be very important to know that if, uh, if somebody who was young was using drugs and alcohol? Sure, if it was an acute problem. Well, doctor, can, can drugs um, exacerbate seizures or the frequency of seizures? Yes, they can lower the seizure threshold, yes. And by lower the seizure threshold, you mean he can have, the individual can have more seizures or greater seizures? Yes, it would increase the likelihood of having a seizure if they're using substances. And specifically, methamphetamine on a brain is very impactful, correct? Yes. Uh, well, I wouldn't say very impactful. It can, it can be stopped and people can recover from using it. But if somebody is chronically using it, it's going to affect their brain, correct? Um, that, that's, a, that's sort of a spectrum of... of effect. Um, it would be difficult to answer that. Uh, certainly it could. I would expect it to have some impact, but you know, we have, for instance, we have um, people who have used crack cocaine for many, many years, and uh, the damage from that you would expect to be significant. It's very similar to methamphetamine. It's a stimulant. It's strong. Um, but in fact, those people, when they stop, are completely normal, and babies who are exposed to it uh, because their mothers were doing uh, cocaine, are you know we expected sort of a storm of abnormal babies from the crack cocaine epidemic, and those babies actually turned out to be fine. Um, you spoke earlier about the white um, lesions on the brain from yeah. the MRI. Um, isn't it true that those white lesions can also be caused by methamphetamine use? Yes, it could be. And in this, in your evaluation of the defendant, you said that you 
reviewed an MRI. Did you re did you just review one MRI? Yes. And one set of PET scans. Yes. And those would have been from 2020. I do not recall the date. I apologize. <laughs> um, did you review any other uh, CT imaging or brain scans for Mr. Wiggins? No. None were available. Are you aware that there are reports of a CT scan on Mr. Wiggins' brain? Oh, I did see mention of a, of a CAT scan, yes, CT. In a 2014, uh, I believe it's going to be 2014, after his reported ATV accident? Uh, yes, I'm sure there was. And do you remember the outcome of that being normal? Yes, that, w I, that, wouldn't, that would be expected on a CAT scan, which is sort of a very vague picture of the brain that we don't see much anatomy from. But in that hospital, in, in that entry, they had no issues at that point with his brain? Correct. And in your report, um, Mr. Wiggins, I, I believe part of this is self-reporting, is that correct, um, when he's describing how he feels during a seizure? That would be self-reporting. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. it, uh, that he has head pains, respirations, and out-of-body feeling. Uh, left hand stiffness spreads up to the arm and then to the leg in over tingling of seconds. Uh, and that he reports that he cannot speak, hear, or see to the left when these occur. Yes. Okay. Um, and then you went on to state that this may or may not then spread throughout the brain, resulting in the generalized tonic clonic, which would be what we consider to be a grand mal seizure, correct? Correct. So it starts there, he feels it, he knows it's going on, and then he fully seizes. Yes. Not always, though, it may just stay focal. And then you have a statement in here that says that after this post-ictal period, he becomes combative and is reported to take swings at people. Was that self-reported? That was self-reported. He told me that. Yeah. So you don't have any actual data to back that up independently? Uh, there were no, uh, there was nothing about it in the records that I saw. And you, reveal, and you reviewed his prior medical records and the jail records? Yes, those that were available to me. Okay. Um, and then you also went on to say that he continues to have seizures monthly and focal seizures monthly as well. Um, is there any documentation, doctor? When I, went, when I went through this, I couldn't find any specific documentation about uh, his seizures being monthly um, from records. They were sporadic and one or two a month. The records I saw were anywhere from two to seven a month that were documented. What specific records were you looking at? Uh, jail, jailhouse prison records of uh, um, staff having documented. Seeing Do you remember season. the years for that? Starting in, I have to look. I can't off the top of my head. There were some as early as 2001, but from the current records, uh, 2007, it was clear that he was having between two and seven seizures a month. And that was in 2007? Uh, but there's documentation as far back as 2001, but since he was rarely in um, custody or in uh, a place where they would document, uh, we wouldn't know how often he was having seizures. And doctor, he reported a loss of consciousness. So if he's gonna lose consciousness, he's not gonna be, he's not gonna remember what he did during it, correct? It depends on how much of the brain is involved during the seizure. If it spreads to involve the whole brain, then people are typically, depending on how, how long it lasts, they're typically um, take hours to recover and um, uh, may not remember anything. Uh, whereas uh, if it just involves part of the brain, they may uh, uh, recover more quickly, but still be um, still have, you know, not be able to speak if it's from the left brain and not be able to behave if it's from the right brain. Okay. And you stated in here, too, that he reports several head injuries starting at 10 um, when his father hit him, causing loss of consciousness, a motor vehicle accident in 2014, which we'd already discussed that has the CT scan attached to it, then mm -hmm. an accident where he was hit in, the de hit in on the head by a door and passed out. Did you record any other um, traumatic incidents in your interview with him? 
Not to my knowledge. I can look. You may have something there. The ATV. Uh, hit by, I think Dad hit him on the head, skull at one point, and he was tased in 2015. And his brother was chasing him with a vacuum. I don't have the year for that. And, and the tasing in 2015, um, are you aware that that's because you charged at officers? Jackson. Council approach. Ladies and gentlemen, let me take something up outside your presence just uh, out of an abundance of caution. If you'll step, step out. Just a moment to make sure they're in the room. All right. You will restate your, you said you were going to rephrase your question. Rephrase your question and ask it again, please. Okay. Um, doctor, uh, are you aware that uh, there's a report of the defendant um, being tased and hitting his head on concrete? I don't recall that report. Uh, I did, I think he told me something about it. Now, Your Honor, uh, sorry, ma'am, you said that you <laughs> reviewed the medical records for Mr. Wiggins? Yes. Um, I don't know if I can approach. You might. Can you tell me if you reviewed that medical record? No. You did not review that medical record? Correct. <clears throat> this is a record about having been tased by a police officer in, 20, in 2016. So is your purpose to ask this question in front of the jury to show that there were medical records you didn't review? Is that your intent? Yes, Your Honor, and the omission of this in the report. Because there are notes, there are her actual notes. I can approach her with that. Well, ask anything you want to ask about this issue outside the presence of the jury, and then let me have, hear from Mr. Evans. And... Do you recognize the handwritten notes, that, a copy of the notes that I have given you? Yes. Are those your notes from the examination of Mr. Wiggins? Yes. And do they state on the top there that uh, there was a tasing incident in 2000 and I think, I think you wrote down 15? Yes. That's what he so told me. In view of that, is that where that information came from? Was that medical record or just a statement? A statement from, from Mr. Wiggins. Mr. Wiggins. All right. And so the reason that you would want to then ask her about that medical report would be what, General? Um, because she had already stated that she reviewed the medical records that were available to her. And I wanted to know whether or not this medical record was available to her. 
All right. And it's a medical record of that incident that occurred when he was tased and fell and hit his head on the concrete. Yes, Your Honor. And that occurred in what year? 2010? <laughs> no, Your Honor. Uh, that, she has the medical record right now. I believe it's 2014 or 15. I don't have all the records with me. It may have been buried somewhere in some of the records. Um, so I do not recall seeing If all you wanted to do is ask the witness about whether or not she reviewed that medical report of that incident and whether or not she is aware of what was contained within that report, if she's testified she didn't review it, then all she can do is say, no, I didn't review it. I don't think she could then be used to introduce that report. Um, I'll, I'll, let me hear from Mr. Evans, I think. Do you have anything you want to add to it? Well, two, well, two, I think there's two issues, Judge. One, one issue, I think Your Honor has addressed. I, I, I agree. I don't think she can, she can identify the report because she didn't review it. She can't introduce it. The second issue that was most problematic is the question that was posed by the Sege was, Warren Archer, were you aware that he was tased after charging at officers? That has nothing to do whatsoever with her testimony. It has nothing to do with a, a proper cross-examination of whether she reviewed the records themselves. And it, had, it, it went beyond what she said was in her notes. Because when she initially started the cross, she indicated that Well, General Sege has stated she was going to uh, rephrase her question. She did rephrase her question. When the jury returns, I will instruct them to disregard the part that I've sustained an objection to the phrasing of the first question that I've allowed the state to re-ask the question. Thank you. We are ready for the jury. And then we'll just allow you to ask Dr. Karen whether she reviewed, if she recalls reviewing this particular document and and let you ask whether, because it is a document or medical report regarding the incident with the tasing, but we'll limit it to that. Ring the jury. Apologize. I know it prolongs things for the procedure we have to go through now with the four alternates, but it is important that we try to make sure the integrity of keeping you all separated in case some issue arises. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Prior to my sending you out of the room, there was an objection to a form of a question that General Segi was asking, and I have sustained that objection to the way that question was worded, and I'm instructing you to disregard that uh, question, and the state will be allowed to restate the question in proper form, but you're not to consider the wording of that question in your decision. Thank you, General I'm Segi. actually going to move back one, one step. Dr. Karin, you had previously testified that 
you knew about a 2014 uh, ATV accident um, that the patient had, that the defendant had uh, told you about, and that you reviewed the medical records on that. Do you recall that? Uh, there was, there were scant records, but yes. With the CT scan. Yes. Doctor, do you recognize those records? Not exactly these records, no. With a CT scan from 2014? I mean, it, 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 the records I saw did not look exactly like this. What was the difference? Um, I don't remember seeing the, the figure of the, of the male with the areas of damp of uh, injury. But I remember uh, the content overall. Okay, and that content is correct with the uh, ATV and the 2014 CT scan? Yes. All right. Your Honor, we move that to state's next exhibit. Well, this would be exhibit 263. And for the record, that is a copy of a medical report regarding the uh, incident with a if you will state specifically what it is again. Yes, that is the 2014 medical record of the ATV uh, and CT scan. Now, doctor, I would ask you before did... Let's hand that to the clerk. Uh, doctor, if you will hand it, you've already got it. All right, thank you. I ask you if uh, there was reported of any other you know, trauma that was reported, specifically tasing? Yes. The, those and the the injured the things that happened at home with his brother and his father. Okay, so in your report, the several head injuries starting at ten when he hit when his father hit him, a motor vehicle accident which we have records for, and an accident where he's hit on a door and passed out. And there's another um, thing that was reported by the defendant, which was being tased and falling on concrete. Yes. Did you receive any medical records in regards to that? Uh, I. I don't recall seeing that. Doctor, have you seen those medical records before? Not exactly this format, no. It's possible that I saw, that I saw some of this, but I, I honestly can't say. Okay. So you can't say whether or not you reviewed any medical records based on the self-reported tasing and hitting his head on the concrete. Correct. He reported it and it, uh, there may have been uh, some in, some uh, reference to it in the records I reviewed. Is there any reason it was left out in your report? I don't believe I summarized all of the head injuries. I didn't think they were uh, necessarily the, that significant in terms of his current problems. So. It possible head injury from 2015 wasn't important in the analysis of this defendant, this patient? It's important, uh, but I don't think, I don't believe that it caused the, the brain damage that we're talking about. But you've testified that you can't really tell the age of damage in somebody's brain. Well, we, we can tell, we can give an estimate of the damage, uh, the, the uh, age of the damage. But wouldn't it have been helpful for you to have had these records so that you could uh, utilize them in your complete and thorough analysis of the injuries sustained and the condition of the defendant? I don't think it would have added that much, honestly. I knew about the, the injuries. Did you ask anybody for those medical records? Um, I mean, I think I had an, a sufficient information to draw a conclusion. All right. Thank you. And, Doctor, moving on to your report, you talk about a physical examination of the defendant. Yes. Uh, and you specifically, you said that his extremities, his arms, are shorter. How much shorter? I did not measure it. I did not have... Uh, a way to measure at the time, and I did not write down an approximate measure. And these things may change uh, depending on, you know, how recent a seizure w was and 
uh, whether or not there's spasms on the affected side, which, which can change arm length and face spasm. So you didn't document the physical findings of, that you drew conclusions on, um, that one of his arms is a different length than the other? Um, I did not document how many centimeters or millimeters difference there was. And These are not typically things that we measure. But there's things that you reported and noted in your report, in your neurological report, but you didn't document the length or difference. Uh, it's not something that's really amenable to measuring, you know, for instance, if I move my shoulder slightly one direction or the other, um, I mean, I would have had to have uh, much better technology in order to, to, give, to, to actually do a, um, a reliable measurement. So then, by what you just said, you took an unreliable measurement of the defendant. There's, an, there's, a, di there's a difference. I did not measure it. But you did report a difference, just an unmeasured difference. Yes. And doctor, isn't it true that there are several different, there's lots of different causes for having um, one limb a little bit longer than another limb, like fractures, for example? Yes, that could cause a, a limb difference. It didn't. It would not have caused the, the entire left side to be damaged or show signs of central nervous system damage. But doctor, you didn't measure any of these physical findings. I did. I checked. I did a, a, a neurologic examination, as is customary. And doctor, in here, you talk about um, there being issue with uh, an area of the brain that is reduced judgment and attention, um, dealing with the spread of seizure focus from that area. Are you trying to say that when Mr. Wiggins is having a seizure, he suffers from reduced cognition, disinhibition, and problems with his emotional regulation? It would make that, it could make that worse for sure. That's not the only time he has those problems. Are you aware? You, you said that you refer, you uh, referenced records. Did you look at Mr. Wiggins' work history at all? There was some um, note about his having come in from a, from a work uh, situation. I didn't know what the job was or how it related to his presentation. So would it be important to know what kind of work Mr. Wiggins did to try to figure out if he could um, function um, with his uh, cognition? Well, I know that he did some plumbing work, for instance, and um, which is interesting because on his neuropsychological testing, he, he does have intact vi visual spatial abilities, although he has reduced processing speed. Um, so he does depend on that. Um, so he did depend on that for plumbing. Now, Doctor, you talked about reduced um, cognition speed, is that correct? Yes, processing speed. Processing speed. So is it your opinion that he would have a hard time doing a lot of multiple complex tasks in a row to, to, end, to get to an end result? Well, the, the reduced processing speed is basically taking visual information and making use of it. So it may take him longer to take in visual information and, and use it in an intelligent way. Um, he might have trouble switching from, um, from one set of, of um, functions or um, something that he's doing into another set of, um, of function. He's going he, he's gonna to have reduced speed of cognitive switching. Staying, staying in the set of what he's doing. But you're not saying he can't do methodical, systematic tasks in a row? No, he can. What about tasks that require adaptation? 
over time he would be able to. Doctor, have you seen, uh, were you, in, in the records that re you reviewed, did you see the f body camera footage? No, I did not. So you're not actually aware of the methodical and quick actions of the patient? Objection. Objection? As Our question is that's the bottom. Well, I think it's the phrasing of the question that's uh, at issue, so I will sustain the objection, rephrase your question. So, Doctor, you just stated that you didn't see the, the video of the body camera. So no, I was not given the video of the body camera. And I preferred not to form an opinion about the crime. Would seeing uh, the patient um, complete tasks be relevant for your evaluation on his cognitive functioning? It's very difficult to tell. For instance, when somebody is having a seizure, we can't really even tell if they're having repetitive behavior. We can't tell if they're seizing or not sometimes without having the electrodes on their head. So you can have a camera on somebody, for instance, in the video monitoring unit in the hospital and, have, and see them doing complex, um, what looks like voluntary behavior and then look at the, the EEG and see that they're actually in a complex or, or a complex focal, focal seizure. So it's very, sometimes we just can't tell. So but doctor, you haven't seen the video, you don't know how long it is and you don't know all the different activities that happen, is that correct? That's correct, I think I uh, heard about snippets of it but I did not view the video. Well, Pass the witness, Your Honor. Mr. Evans, redirect. Yes, Your Honor. So, Dr. Karen, <clears throat> first thing, you were cross-examined about this issue of whether or not you measured with like, I assume with like a measuring tape when you did your physical assessment of, uh, or evaluation, examination of Mr. Wiggins. Yes. You did not measure him. Correct. Is it standard protocol in, in, for a neurologist with your expertise in doing that assessment, whether in your office or on another location to, to whip out a, a measuring tape and actually get down to the exact centimeters of or millimeters or inches or whatever that is to for you to be able to find that there's asymmetries? Uh, no, I'd be surprised if that's ever been done. It's possible that a pediatrician might do it if there's a, a, you know, a, a remarkable uh, asymmetry. Were there asymmetries with his arms? Yes. All right. Definitely. Um, now, you said that on, on the, you were asked this question about on, on cross examination. Can that could that have potentially uh, could you have some a uh, some a shorter arm uh, if the, if there was a broken bone? And you said I think that yeah, that's possible, All right? Yes, it's more common in the leg. A fractured leg bone might cause somebody to have a bit shorter leg. All right, but but Stephen Wiggins had asymmetries to his face, right? Correct. Is that from a broken? Did, like if you broke his face? Maybe? No, <laughs> no. So. In your expertise, as a neurologist, who's done thousands of these assessments, what does that tell you when someone has asymmetries to their face, like Mr. Wiggins did? That there's a, a cortical uh, brain problem on the opposite side uh, of the, of the uh, facial asymmetry. Now, you were also asked a lot about drug use and whether meth affects the, the brain and could damage the brain. You remember that? Yes. Based on what you've seen specifically as to the facial asymmetry, what does that tell you about whether or not Stephen's brain damage came from some kind of drug use or was in fact probably perinatal? Well, the, the brain damage is not from drug use and the, the uh, severity or the, um, the appearance of the facial asymmetry and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the body, the left side asymmetry is not from 
a recent or, or semi-recent injury. Now It takes years to develop that kind of asymmetry. And so it didn't happen in 2015 when he had some kind of AT, ATV accident? No way. Okay. All right. And you were asked about a CAT scan. Mm -hmm. And you said you were actually, you had reviewed records, saw records where a CAT scan, I think, had come back uh, showing, I think they were saying there was nothing, no issue, and they did a CAT scan of his head. Yes, that's to be expected. They can't see that part of the brain on a CAT scan. So explain that. What is a CAT? What what can you see with a CAT scan? Well, you see, you get a good look at bone uh, and sinuses, and you get sort of a a very blurry picture of of brain. Uh, you can't really see the gray matter uh, versus the white matter, although there is a little bit of shading difference. Uh, you certainly can't see something in the orbital orbital frontal region because the slices don't involve. Uh, don't show that area. So, in your in your experience and expertise, a CAT scan would not have been sufficient to show the brain damage that Stephen Wiggins has, correct? Correct. But an MRI would, and in fact did, correct? Yes. And then the PET scan not only showed the structural damage, but didn't it in fact show the metabolic damage to Stephen Wiggins' brain? Correct. Some, yes. Well, yeah, significantly. And that, the damage showed by the PET scan was, was exactly in the same area, was it not, in large part, as where the MRI showed, correct? That's right. And where you expected those findings before you ever saw the MRI, based on your evaluation of Stephen Wiggins and review of records, the part of the brain you thought was affected as well. That's right. Now, you were also asked about few things about Stephen Wiggins' uh, self-report on seizures, and I think the question was, did he self-report on how the seizures made him feel? Um, is it pretty typical that someone has to tell you how a seizure makes them feel? Oh yes, we, that's where we get the uh, that's where we get the history. That's where we get the um, we have to ask them. We can't. We don't have a magic way of finding out how the seizure starts or what they experience at the, at the onset of the seizure. It's purely subjective from them. And we, you talked about seizure records that you reviewed. And then is that what you're talking about is where others have, have witnessed a seizure or by, by Mr. Wiggins and noted it in records? That's right. And, you know, you recall whether or not they've noted Mr. Wiggins bleeding from the nose after a seizure? Yes. Um, whether they've noted him uh, losing his losing bladder control during a seizure? Yes. That wasn't self-report, right? No. Did you find sufficient information to confirm that Stephen Wiggins has, has been having consistent seizures almost on a monthly basis um, since he was around 13, 14 years old? Yes. One moment, Your Honor. State asked you whether or not you would watch the video in this case? Yes. The body cam video? You weren't asked to watch the body cam video, right? I, no, I wasn't. And regardless of what Mr. Wiggins did in 2018, did, would that in any way change your opinion about the brain damage that he has had most likely since birth? No, it's, it wouldn't change that. And does it affect your opinion when, at all about the seizures? that he has? No. Would it affect your opinion based on uh, if you that information, would it affect your opinion on where those seizures centralize? No, not brain? at all. No. And what part of the brain is affected by the seizures? Well, uh, he reported not being able to see well to the left when the sheriff came up to the car. And um, 
possibly the body cam could have told me something about that. I didn't see it. Um, th that's all I know about the crime. But that would have been consistent with having been possibly having some seizure activity at the onset of the crime. But you're not giving any opinion to that because you didn't see that? Correct. And we didn't have electrodes on his head. Nobody can say for sure. Thank you. That was my question. General Segi. So, Dr. Karen, you were asked about whether or not your opinion would change um, if you saw the video. Would your opinion change if you saw him doing uh, several things and multitasking all at one time for his cognition? No, I, no I, I think we've established that he has major behavioral and problems and difficulty uh, in, uh, inhibiting or um, stopping maladaptive behavior. He can't turn off his his impulses very very well and or at all at times. So your testimony is that he basically uh, can do lots of complex things but just doesn't want to stop. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that. I don't think we have enough information. Um, some people do very complex things um, with brain damage. Some people do uh, very complex things during seizures. Uh, we just don't know. And doctor, would it change your opinion on anything if after being diagnosed the defendant um, just didn't participate in taking his seizure medication or any seizure therapy? No, I, the seizure medicine isn't really helping him that much, in my opinion. I, I mean, he's clearly still having seizures, and it, I'm sure it has side effects. He's on antipsychotics, probably because it, the the the, the uh, seizure medication has some mood effects. Thank you. Redirect. Do you recall what antipsychotic medication? Haldol. That's my question. Anything further from the state? Dr. Karen, you are released. You may go about your business. Thank you. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a question that was submitted to me during Dr. Karen's testimony that uh, the question was, have the defendant been given an IQ test? I, count, I uh, consulted with counsel, and there is a witness who may testify about that issue, but not Dr. Karen. So thank you. All right, you may call your next witness. It's almost 2.30. Let's just go ahead and take our afternoon recess and we'll go from there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take our afternoon recess, but I'm going to stay in here. I want to talk with the lawyers for a moment. So, y'all go ahead and exit. quiz on that stuff I gave you all this morning about the Olympics return, so we gave them, uh, they haven't been able to watch any of the Olympics, so Ms. Jones thankfully prepared a uh, summary of all of the events and the medals that were won for them to be able to review. We're grateful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
is a housekeeping matter just so that it's clear in the record. And that's, again, what we continually are trying to do is make sure that the record is clear. Um, <clears throat> in order to introduce the victim impact statement, the court would have had to find that there was at least one of the aggravating factors had been established and um, based on the proof at trial and at the uh, sentencing hearing prior to the victim impact statement, the court did find that, that there was sufficient information in the record that would justify the introduction of the victim impact statement. Uh, based upon those facts then, um, we will adjourn for our recess, rather, for our afternoon break, and I'd like to see counsel around the corner, please. So. All right. Board of recess.